Hi, I'm Professor Mark Grabowski. Today we'll be discussing management of a crisis. Often this is where the rubber meets the road in the practice of public relations. Organizations need help when confronted by a sudden crisis. And instinctively these days, CEOs look to public relations advisors to take charge when crisis strikes. That's why the highest paid public relations counselors are those associated with managing crises. First, let's define what is a crisis. One prominent public relations counselor defines it as unplanned visibility. It's basically an event, rumor, or story that has the potential to affect your reputation, image, or credibility in a negative way. Nobody's safe from a crisis. A crisis can strike at any time. In this era of Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, every organization and individual is in danger of facing a crisis. Many companies, in fact, never have more than one crisis. Know why? Because they don't survive the first one. If you're watching this video, you're likely a public relations student, and there are all kinds of potential crisis communication situations for colleges. For example, problems may include a violence or a shooting, such as the ones that occurred at Virginia Tech, Alabama, and other universities. There could be health hazards, such as meningitis, food poisoning. Uh, there may be a tragedy, such as a student dying of alcohol poisoning, uh, which recently happened at Villanova University. There could be an athletic scandal. Uh, you know, athletes sometimes cheat on exams. They might accept bribes. They might be accused of crimes, things of that nature. There could be controversial remarks made by a school official. For example, Harvard's former president created a stir by making some controversial comments about women. There could be labor strife, such as an employment strike. There could even be innocuous things. For example, some universities recently have run into problems when they've tried to uh, shut down certain departments or make athletic cuts. Even ordinary college students can face potential issues. For example, something might go wrong at an internship. There may be embarrassing emails that get forwarded to the masses. A jealous peer might spread lies on a gossip website. Or it could be something as simple as a couple breaking up, blaming each other, and forcing mutual friends to take sides. The point is that college students might also have to deal with crisis uh, management situations on a daily basis as well. Organizations tend to experience crises in stages. Uh, first, they're surprised. It's usually unexpected, and you're made first aware of it by a reporter. And then there's insufficient information. Rumors fly. Blog attacks begin. It's difficult to get a grasp on everything that's happening. As a result, events start escalating. There's a sense of a loss of control. Too many things are happening at once. Erroneous stories hit newsstands and airwaves, and rampant rumors can't be controlled. There's increased outside scrutiny. Media, talk show hosts, stockbrokers, politicians, the general public feed on rumors. People want answers and want to know what's going on. So as a result, the organization feels sort of like a siege mentality. As the organization feels surrounded, lawyers advise them not to say anything. Then panic sets in. The organization feels like walls are caving in and leaks too numerous to plug. And panic pervades. Management is afraid to take immediate action. Remember, the cardinal rule of communicating in a crisis is to tell the truth, tell it all, and tell it fast. The first inclination for a lot of executives is to say, let's wait until all the facts are in. But as President Carter's press secretary used to say, bad press is a lot like fish. It doesn't get better with age. So be prepared, be available, be credible, and act appropriately. Plan ahead. Don't wait for a crisis to strike to spring into action. Develop a plan ahead of time while everything is going well. The moment the crisis happens is the wrong time to come up with a plan. Having a crisis plan is like buying insurance. Nobody wants to spend the time or money until a crisis happens, and then everyone panics because they don't know what to do. This can kill a company or destroy a brand. Make sure a plan that outlines exactly what you're going to do is in place before something happens. You need to know simple things like who makes the decisions, how do you get in touch with the CEO at home, how do you get in touch with the CEO on vacation. Think about it. If a crisis occurs at 3 a.m. in the Far East, three key people, 
the head of public relations, the head of the legal department, and the CEO might need to talk in the middle of the night. If you have no plan in place, try to find them all at that hour and then try crafting a response. It's not easy. So set up a team and a contact list ahead of time. Have a deputy crisis team leader in case the team leader is not available or can't be reached. Act quickly. In today's internet and cable dominated society, it is important to act quickly and decisively to restore an organization or individual's most important commodity, credibility. The quickest way to end the agony and build back credibility is to communicate through the media. Your reputation is at stake. How an organization handles itself in the midst of a crisis may influence how it is perceived for years to come. Poor handling of events with the magnitude of BP's oil spill, Major League Baseball steroid scandal, or Denny's racial bias accusations can not only cripple the organization's reputation, but also cause enormous monetary loss, or even cause its demise. It is essential that such emergencies be managed intelligently and forthrightly with the news media, employees, and community at large. Now, if you do find yourself in a crisis, take these steps to respond. First, define the risk. For example, the poison in the pill will make you sick, or the recall will cost stockholders $100 million. Second, determine actions that will mitigate the risks, such as don't take the pill, or we are recalling the product. The public is more likely to believe in your solutions if you do a credible job in defining the risk. Third, identify the cause of the risks. If the public believes you know what went wrong, they are more likely to accept that you will quickly fix the problem. That's why people get back on planes after plane crashes. Moreover, you're likely to get less bad speculation and more balanced media coverage. Fourth, demonstrate responsible management action. This is most essential. Moving to fix the problem. Some executives make the mistake of thinking crises are solved through technique or intuition. That's hogwash. Much more important is to correct the issue that got you in trouble in the first place. In dealing with the media, organizations should set up a media response plan, such as a number to call, who will talk, what's off limits, a channel through which all authorized communication must flow. They should provide box score data, media like numbers, for example, how many people got fired or laid off, how many people perished in this accident, what was the cost of the damage, etc., things like that. Avoid speculation. It's suicidal. Move swiftly. Remember, the media is 24-7, so you need to monitor it and nip problems such as misinformation on a blog in the bud before it spreads and gets worse. And feed the beast. If you don't give the media information, you leave a vacuum that your critics will fill. Better you talk to them than them. Don't just talk to the media, though. Throughout the crisis, it's imperative that the crisis team communicates with the company's key publics or stakeholders, such as any group that might have heightened interest in what the crisis is. For example, if you're a publicly held company, the shareholders fall into that category. If it's about a product distributed via retail, stakeholders include your customers. It always includes the press. And don't forget to talk to employees. When possible, employees, or members of the organization, should be informed before the press. They may feel betrayed if they learn about news involving them only after their neighbor says, turn on the TV. Also, be sure to keep the frontline employees, such as the person who answers the phones or customer service reps, updated on where to direct customer or media calls regarding the crisis. Try to avoid saying no comment. Lawyers will tell you not to say anything, or to say as little as possible, as quietly as possible. Of course, Lawyers are correctly focused on defense in the court of law, but you can't overlook the court of public opinion. That's where PR people focus, and no comment there won't cut it. Your spokesperson should not respond to media questions with no comment, because this answer can imply a lack of cooperation, an attempt to hide something, or a lack of concern. Consider that studies show that 65% of people associate no comment with the commentator being guilty. While you should consult with legal counsel to ensure that you don't say something that could get you into even more trouble, you also shouldn't plead the fifth. 
there are more appropriate responses uh, when you either don't have a response or are not at liberty to give certain information after the crisis. Winning in court is only half the battle. Remember that we live in a society where people are presumed innocent only until accused otherwise. Perhaps understandably so. There is a difference between legal guilt and factual guilt. For example, eight Chicago White Sox players who became known as the infamous Black Sox were acquitted of fixing games in court in 1919, but they were kicked out of Major League Baseball for life. So winning in a court of law is pointless if you lose everything in the court of public opinion. Bad publicity can drive down sales and stock prices and drive you out of business. Therefore, when facing a crisis, having a good public relations plan is just as important as having a strong legal defense. Now keep in mind everything we've talked about so far are just guidelines. Sometimes a comment is worse than no comment. Remember the 2006 West Virginia mine explosion when, after the miners had been underground for 41 hours, the mine owner made a statement saying they were found alive. Well, the media spread the news and the nation rejoiced, but a day later, the report was found to be untrue, wishful thinking based on misunderstood communication. The CEO apologized, but at that point the damage had been done. And sometimes it is better to wait until all the information is in, as Wendy's learned from the customer finding a finger in her food hoax. Bottom line, every call is a close one, and there is no guarantee that an organization will benefit no matter what course is chosen. Remember though, honesty is the best policy, and there's evidence to support this. A Stanford University study, for example, found that the stock prices of companies that took responsibility for their own poor financial performances outperformed the shares of companies that, instead, blamed someone or something else. In other words, the best spin is no spin. Of course, if you're innocent of wrongdoing, you should fight to clear your name and get justice. Enlist credible third parties to defend you and cite objective information. But admit when you're wrong. Americans tend to err on the side of forgiving transgressors. Take a look at the sports world, for example. In 2003, Kobe Bryant's image took a big hit when he cheated on his wife and was accused of sexual assault. But the basketball star made a public mea culpa to the victim, and the incident eventually faded away in the media. Soon after, Bryant's jersey was once again selling well and endorsement deals were piling up. Michael Vick, on the other hand, learned the hard way that the public hates being lied to. After being accused of organizing dogfights, the NFL star continued to maintain his innocence until he no longer could. The widespread perception was that he finally apologized because he had run out of options. And because his apology seemed insincere, he received a much harsher sentence than he otherwise would have. He's making a comeback now, but faces a much more difficult road to redemption than Kobe did. So in closing, the lesson is, admit when you messed up, apologize, explain how you're going to fix it, and then do what you promised.